Hi, my name is Doug Vogt from the Diehl Foundation. And I've been anxious to do and get to this uh, video series on Joseph. It's in volume two of Decoding the Hebrew Scriptures. The reason is, is you, most people do not understand how important Joseph was to us even today and what happened to him and uh, the results of what he did saved a lot of people, which I'll explain in a few minutes to you. Uh, there should be three parts to this series. This is going to be part one. Uh, on this one, I'm going to carry, uh, cover the early years of Joseph, including receiving the golden calf, uh, why his brothers sold him. Uh, it has to do with the two dreams, and they're not just dreams. Uh, which Egyptian purchased him as a slave? The interpretation of the two dreams of the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh who made him prime minister and gave him a wife. You're going to be surprised about this, but the proof I'm giving is irrefutable. You'll really enjoy it, and you'll be surprised people hadn't figured this out in the past since all the clues that Moses gave. Uh, I'm going to give you this information from chapter 10 of God's Day of Judgment. Oh, I don't want to forget my pointer. People keep saying, don't stand in front of the screen. Uh, this is the book, Volume 2, Joseph and Slavery for the Hebrews. And this is the reason why he's so important. Uh, in this series, uh, 8, 9, and 10. 8 was on Abraham, 9 is on Joseph, the other one's on 10. This is the reason why. If he hadn't figured out or known about this drought, uh, he collected and accumulated so much wheat over the seven years of plenty that he was able to save probably two million people, people from as far away as from Persia all the way to, to maybe as far as Greece in the north, and all of North, north Africa, Ethiopia, Egypt, obviously, and Sudan, and maybe even further south, and maybe as far north as Turkey. Uh, the drought was that bad. And unless he had done that, he must have saved maybe two million people. And unless he did that, that accumulated, those two million people over 3,500 years is probably 200 to 300 million people today descended from those folks. They wouldn't be here, including the Hebrews. They wouldn't be there. Most of the Egyptians would, would have all been dead from the famine. Very few would have been left. Um, and, and the rest, it's, that's how important he is and what he did. And I'll, I'll go to a little bit about it at the end of this video, the ramifications of it, what it means for us, and how he got this information, which is the most important. For those of you who are atheists or agnostics, this is not religion. Look at this as history, and you're going to be amazed at it, and you're really going to enjoy it, especially when you find out... Uh, who his girlfriend was and who the pharaoh was and what happened and what she did. The other books, uh, Moses and Ten Code Systems, unless you know Moses' code systems, you're never going to figure out this story. Moses encoded it very heavily and deeply in order to, he wanted to tell the truth and tell the secret, but he didn't want it to be obvious what had happened. And I'll explain why as I go through this thing. Uh, you can see in Abraham's first law, so uh, series eight, part two, is covering the Abraham part, part two of it. Series six is on Moses' ten co-systems, part one and two. If you haven't seen them yet, you sh that'll at least tell you the codes and why he had to do what he did. And of course, the creation of the Hebrew alphabet, you'll understand why this surface story is so disjointed and why you had to put in so much code in here uh, and create the code systems, because he was stuck with this sequence of symbols he couldn't change, and he had to create the word breaks. And over time, you found out, if, you're, if you watch these videos, that the priest class in the first temple period and later changed the word breaks to suit their own feelings and ideology. Okay, story starts. His mother, Rachel, uh, took, his, took her father, Laban, um, golden calf or idol. It was a fertility idol from the Hittites, and this is what one of them looked like from uh, the uh, Turkish Museum. We don't know exactly which one he had, but he had a gold one. 
So Joseph gave him this valuable golden calf, which there was one reason why his brothers hated him. But um, the surface story is that it, he, he created a, uh, a, coat of, a, a coat of many colors or a long sleeve coat is the way it's translated. But really, when you saw the, the, these two parts here, you know it was uh, chapter and verse total with a cast, cast golden idol is really what it turned out to be. That's how you figure out this. <clears throat> oh, okay, what's important about this one here is Shechem. Most people think, and, and the, the, the great scholars think, that Shechem is this town north of of Jerusalem, and that's where they think Abraham was and Jacob. No, you're going to understand what the Shechem was and how it's encoded here. So we started in. Jacob journeyed to Sukkot and built him a house and made booths for his cattle. And, and Jacob came in a peace in the village or hamlet of Shechem. There's another thing. They translate this word as being city or town and stuff like that. I looked it up. It's a village or hamlet, a really small thing, which is in the land of Canaan. Uh, and he brought a parcel. He bought a parcel of a field uh, where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. In other words, Shechem was the name of the son of Hamor, not the name of a town. This is where it gets interesting. <clears throat> Genesis 40, uh, 34.1. And Dana, that was the daughter from Leah, that was their own, only daughter, 12 boys and one daughter, which she bore unto uh, Jacob and went out to see the daughters of the land. Wanted to see who the neighbors were. And then Shechem, the son of Hamor, the king, he was the head of this town or village, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, took her, and lay with her, and defiled her. He raped her. Seems to be a common thing in the, in the Middle East. <clears throat> the two families made an agreement. Jacob was not too happy with this. They made an agreement that basically all the males in his little village, basically probably his relatives, all had to be circumcised and they'd be part of the tribe. Well, that didn't work out too good for some of them. Uh, we certainly, after three days, after getting circumcised, and you know, that hurts, Levi and Simon went back and slaughtered all the men of the village, killed them all, and retrieved their sister. And it was the sister got raped, and the guy didn't give her back to Jacob, kept her. That takes gall. <clears throat> Continues, the son of Jacob came upon the slain, and spoiled the village because they had defiled their sister. They basically, what the, the Torah says, they stole everything. The children, the women, gold, silver, cattle, everything they took, like a bunch of marauding gypsies. They ran through and cleaned the place out. Then Jacob finds out about it, and he was not happy at all, for obvious reasons. And Jacob said to Simon and Levi, you have troubled me to make me to stink among the inhabitants of the land among the Canaanites. He was worried the Canaanites would raise an army and come down and slaughter them and kill them, which is a good bet. So after that, they, they left the town and went back to Mount Sinai, the homestead. Shechem is not a town in North Jerusalem like most people think. As you can see, it is the name of the person that kidnapped and raped Dina. Uh, I think that the Hebrews, after they took over that part of Canaan, named the town Shechem to show that their family had done wrong and wanted to remember the village of Shechem. The ark sent some time there in northern Shechem and an altar was discovered there. I think when I covered um, that with the ark, I showed an altar that was found there in Shechem. It stayed there for an indeterminate period of time. I don't know, 50, 100 years, I don't know. Okay, so now you start taking the words apart. Shechem means to long for, to be blessed. You have to first swap the shin for the adjacent resh, and the first part of the word is uh, berch, which means blessed or blessed or praised. The second part of the word means to pine or long for. 
Remember, Jacob was in, with his, his uncle Laban for 20 years and wasn't in the mountain. The only way you, they could be blessed it was inside the cave where they think they saw God. There's no other way. So you see how Moses slips these codes in to proper names. Joseph had two dreams which he told his parents and brothers. We do not know how old he, he was when these, things, these dreams happened, but his parents and his brothers did not like it one bit. Uh, these are the dreams, and I'll get my comment then. And he said unto them, Here, I pray you this dream which I have dreamt. For behold, we, binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaves arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obedience to my sheaf. Then the second dream he had, it looks like it was the first night. Well, we don't know if it was the same night or it was probably different times. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it to his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obedience to me. Um, okay, first thing you have to say, he, he was sold at the age of 17. So we don't know when he had these dreams. Remember, Moses is telling this story. He's not going to tell you the whole truth because he's trying to conceal what they really have in that cave. He doesn't want anybody to know what's there. So he makes a story like this. And I don't know if it's this kind of a story. It was something really different, more direct. But uh, if it's a normal dream, who cares? Would his, would his other 11 brothers and his parents care if some young teenager or adolescent has a dream? Of course not. You'd laugh it off, say, that's nice, go dream another one. That's normal. The only reason they get pissed off is if they knew he went down deep in that cave and he activated something and something told him a vision of the future. That's the only way they'd be really pissed off. And maybe the reason why they sold him, besides getting the, the, the family uh, idol, um, they were afraid if, well, if they, if they get rid of him, then he won't be, uh, that, that future wouldn't happen. Boy, were they mistaken. We know that he spent a lot of time at home and not with his brothers tending the sheep and livestock. I think he spent a lot of time deep in the cave with some of the other kids too. All right, playing there, I think he got something to work and he saw a glimpse of the future that was the future his parents and brothers did not like. Some of the brothers wanted to kill him. Now, the reason I told you the first story about Shechem and Levi and the other ones, these are clues of who did it. Or possible, possible clues of who suggested to kill this guy. But Reuben and Judah suggested to sell him to the Midianites who were listed as the Ishmaelites, caravan that was passing by. They did for it for 20 shekels of silver. A Roman, a number of years later, wrote a story where he sold his character for 30 pieces of silver. He also loved the name Joseph. One day I'll tell you that part of the story too. When Joseph went to find his brothers, he found them in Dothan, spelled this. <clears throat> the first part of the letters means howling animal or jackal. Before Jacob's death, uh, he prophesies for each one of his sons, there was three sons who appeared to fit that description. Benjamin was described as a wolf that ravish. In the morning, devour the prey. So why would his younger brother want to have Joseph dead or out of the picture? Well, then he'd be the head of the family. He'd get the golden idol. But he'd be the head of the family. That's maybe why. Uh, Genesis 49. The other two sons were Simon and Levi. Uh, Jacob was very unflattering to both. Weapons of violence is their kinship. Let my soul not come into their counsel, unto their assembly. Let my glory not be united, for in their anger they slew men, and in their self-will they howed oxen. I guess it means slaughtered oxen. Uh, Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. 
To scatter them means maybe they had, had no sons and the daughters got married off to the other tribes. This is actually an important clue of, of which tribe disappeared. Sale of Joseph. This is where it gets really interesting. You're going to enjoy this. In Genesis 39, it tells us that uh, Potiphar, a eunuch, now let me stop here. They don't translate the Jewish word or the Hebrew word to eunuch. They call it a captain of the guard, stuff like that. It's not. It's the word for eunuch, which means a man who has been, uh, his, his testicles have been removed. He's no longer really a man. Give me a clue here of Pharaoh, the chief executioner, purchased Joseph. We also learn later in verse 6 that Joseph was lovely of shape and lovely of appearance. Good-looking guy. By 7, we are told, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, uh, Lie with me. The Egyptian name for the Hebrews was Per, per W or Habiru, uh, the Amara tablets. Um, so that's, that's what they called them. So we know the Hebrews were in Egypt at the time. Potiphar is spelled in Hebrew this. When you take the word apart, the first part, Put, Put, which is the Hebrew word for the African land of Put, Punt which is the, by the African horn corn. I'll show you the map in a second. And the second word, resh, can be swapped with the adjacent letter, ein, so you get that, which is the feminine version of beauty or splendor. Now, that's kind of a funny name now, isn't it? But you'll see why. Remember, these are all clues that Moses is giving us. <clears throat> and Joseph found favor in his master's sight, and he ministered him, which means he taught him, taught him some. Uh, and he made him supervisor over his house and all that he had, uh, he put into his hand. There was no butler or baker. The story was used by Moses as a way of telling two aspects of Joseph, uh, which one, which one, one over the other. One of the most coded stories within the Joseph story concerns the dreams the butler and the baker had to interpret while he, the, while they were supposedly in prison with Joseph. So you have to take the words apart. That's the key. Hebrew word for butler is this. The first part of the word means passion, heritage, or inheritance. You can look at that as, as being materialism. The letter H, or he, in, uh, is five in, in large and small numbering, which maybe he's telling us he was a slave for five years. The Hebrew word for baker is this. The true meaning of this word is revealed when you substitute the last letter, he, for the adjacent letter, dalid, to get the word uh, aphed, which is the word ephod of the, of, the, of the priest. The ephod was the official garment that the high priest wore, which, uh, which he wore in front of the ark. In other words, it represents the, re the religious or spiritual man, what he was taught at Mount Sinai with his father and stuff like that. So the way the thing goes is what happens is the butler goes back to work, no problem, and the baker gets hung. That's what happens. So um, what he's saying, what Moses is saying, is that the materialism in Joseph survived and the spiritual part of the religious training that he got from his father, that kind of disappeared. You'll see that in one of the names he uses too. And it came to pass at the end of two years that the Pharaoh dreamed, stand on, was dreamed, standing on a river, and he beheld from the Nile came seven young cows appearance and plump ones grazing in the marsh grass. And behold, seven young cows, other ones coming up after them from the Nile Evil doers, evil ones of appearance and thin ones of flesh, and they are standing beside the young cows on the shore of the Nile. The same night, she has another, the same, another kind of a dream. 
uh, in verse 9, the next day the Pharaoh asked the butler and, and, and interpret, interpretation of the two dreams. The butler said to go to Joseph. Of course, the butler is Joseph. And the Hebrew, the Hebrew and interpret it. By verse 28 to 32, Joseph explains both dreams as being the same thing. He will be, it will be seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. Why did Moses put 27 sevens in chapter 41? That's where this appears. It's number seven, seven represents Mount Sinai for the seven scars on it. Puts 27 of them in them. That's a lot. He's telling you basically that Moses, that Joseph got the interpretation, how to interpret this thing, really from inside the cave years before. I think what happened is he saw something of the future of this plenty, uh, seven years of uh, plenty and then seven year drought that's gonna be horrible. And, but he didn't know when it was gonna happen. Evidently the, what he saw didn't tell him when it was gonna be, only that it was gonna happen. When the Pharaoh has these two dreams, he then knew it was gonna happen now. He interpreted it right, and she believed him. So th that's the reason why, what's going on here. It, it's, Moses is concealing what information they can actually get or what they got from the cave. He doesn't want the other nations or anybody else to know what's in there. Keep that in mind. Uh, this is what Joseph told the Pharaoh. God will surely bring it to pass. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Now, why do they say discreet? Like, be quiet what's going on. <laughs> let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenty years. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, for as much as, now remember, Moses is writing this. He doesn't know what the Pharaoh said. He has no idea. But he's telling you something in the story here. For as much as God has showed thee all this, well, it wasn't the dream of Joseph. It was the dream of Pharaoh that tells you right off the bat, Moses is telling you something, that, they, that Joseph got this from inside the cave. None so understanding or discreet and wise as thou. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And the Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. <clears throat> next, the next thing the Pharaoh does is very strange and unusual. Uh, I'm going to tell you, know, you're going to know everything in a second. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zafina Pena, uh, and he gave him to wife, uh, Astin, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of An. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Now, first you have to say, here's a hyper, An is really uh, Amun, their main god their religion. What right does the Pharaoh have to give someone else's daughter to a guy that supposedly just got out of prison for the unethical attempt of rape? It doesn't make any sense. You understand really what's going to happen in a second. So now let's find out who this person really was. The Hebrew spelling for Potiphera is this. Ignore where the word breaks are, move the yod to the second word. So the first word is again put, the land of punt, which is the Hebrew word for the land of punt. And the second word, this, sounds the same as this, fira, because ayin has no sound value. So the word means feminine version of beauty or splendor. It's the same person. You got it? So the person who bought him as a slave is the person who's giving him a daughter. 
you'll be surprised who that daughter is. Joseph's new name, you gotta take all the names apart. You'll see how heavily coded Moses made this story. He wants to tell the story, but he can't make it overt. I won't even attempt to pronounce the name. There it is. The first part of the word is this, means to conceal, to be hidden, or hidden treasure. Isn't that funny? The, the tet, at the end of the word equals 400, which of course represents the amount of money Abraham bought the cave of Machpelah for, 400 shekels of silver. Okay, the second word, this, uh, I put, I swap the nun for the mem to get the word this, which means to split. The latter uh, word, he, is eight in small number, or het rather, uh, small or large number. Moses used the split because he's telling us that Moses split the treasure just as the legends of the Jews inform us. The number eight told me that Moses knew where the gold and silver was located. He could only know this if he was related by blood to Joseph and his descendants. <clears throat> now, let me explain the two locations. When Joseph sold the grain, uh, they were stored in a place called Sukkot, and then it was taken by barge, and I'm gonna show you in the second video, it's part two video, went down, it sold at what today the town is called Suez City, and then it was called Elam. And he, he received the gold and the silver for the sale of the grain, then he took a trip east to a spent gold mine, which you're gonna see, you see, and he, he stored it there. When he filled up that cave, he had it shipped to the family burial cave. So, we'll go on. Uh, so anyway, that's what he did. So Moses knew the whole story. Had to be a relative. Asthenath, the wife of Joseph. Um, Athena was, of course, not her real name. And you're gonna find out what her name is in a second. Because Moses and the rest of the family did not want it known. Moses did, did tell us a lot about the character of Joseph uh, with the choice of his names, the Hebrew name of that, which is spelled this. The first part of the word is atin, atim, uh, because the, the N can be swapped for the min because of sequential letters. The resulting Hebrew word means only. The final letter of Athena's name is the tav, which in Hebrew large number is 400 again, which is the purchase of the cave. So he's saying, he's saying only money. Basically, Joseph is only in love with money. Put the gold in the family cave is what he's basically saying, even with her name. Now, the Egyptians didn't want this known either. That's why he didn't use the real name for her. Uh, the 18th dynasty knew what had happened. Okay, this is where the land of Punt is. Horn of Africa, basically. They sometimes say it's on this part too. Uh, so it's Sudan, Ethiopia, and, and the area around there. Here's your pharaoh. Who's the one who went on a shopping spree to the land of Punt? A Chetsu. A Chetsu. Very beautiful woman. For all the statues we have, she's gorgeous. She's also the first pharaoh that had a lot of money and did a lot of building and a lot of spending. And you've got to ask yourself, Follow the money trail. Where did she get the money? Here's another picture of her when she's trying to act like Pharaoh. Here's another one uh, trying to act like Pharaoh with this size as if she's a, a guy. This is some of the relief on her funeral tomb, which is um, her shopping spree to the land of Punt. This actually Dave, uh, Joseph designed. And you'll see where he's, his tomb was. It was right in front of it. It's gorgeous. I've been there, and it's, it's amazing what they've done. Here's another. This is a picture I took. It's on the walls of that funeral tomb of her shopping spree to the land of Punt. She did more than one shopping spree, like any woman, you know. Got a lot of money. Hey, let's go shopping. Here's more pictures. Here's a, a granite uh, carving of, of her. The Egyptians did great granite uh, carving. I... Uh, I'm impressed because granted is hardness of seven, and to do that good a job, they were very good. Here's another one. Here's 
uh, a relief depicting incense and myrrh trees obtained through Hatshepsut's uh, ex expedition to Punt. Here's more of it, and here's another picture of her. We have lots and lots of statues of her. See, when you have a lot of money, you can afford to build a lot of statues of yourself and monuments. Here's her real husband, Tutmosis II. Um, I estimate that Tutmosis II became pharaoh about 1502 BCE, uh, but his reign was relatively short. Archaeologists think it's between four and 17 years. I figure it about 10 years. His inbreeding affected his health. He was both physically and mentally weak, I guess a dummy, and dominated by his half, his wife and half-sister, Hichetsu. Other derogatory comments about him say that he was overweight, unattractive, slow-witted. He had an overbite which did not help, uh, not help with his appearance. He was a, a partially bald and his face had wrinkles from which one can conclude he was much older than 30. So he marries his half-sister, who's a knockout, and he's a gargoyle. We don't have too many pictures of him. I mean, it was the plain sarcophagus and a couple of reliefs of him, but not much. Uh, his mummy skin was also covered with scab-like patches, which may have resulted from some kind of unknown disease. Almost sounds like psoriasis. The mummy was almost un undecorated and contained a very plain and simple sarcophagus, which closely resembled that of his father, Tumosis I. His sarcophagus was in a state of neglect, so we can assume that no one cared about him or his remains. His wife certainly did. <laughs> she had an affair with you-know-who. Echepta bore him a daughter. This is the only one they know for sure, Nefura. That's her. This is the young Joseph, looks like about 17, late 18 year old, teen or early 20s. And there's the real Pharaoh's daughter with Hichetsu. Um, the second girl, Metri Hichetsu, very hard to find a picture of her. It's like they didn't want, they knew who she was or who the father was and they didn't want it too publicized. But she had a daughter from him. His daughter was Metri. And, okay, let's see. And, and the, uh, the Pharaoh's second wife, uh, Caesar Isis, bore him to Moses III, his uh, heir apparent. Now, when Joseph reveals himself to his brothers, he winds up telling them something very important. It's really Moses is telling us something very important. It's in Genesis 45, 8. There's a phrase uh, before it, and it says basically God, and he hath made me father to Pharaoh, and the Lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. I'll explain what that woman did, a chetsup, and she had a taste of power because the husband was an idiot. So what she, she didn't respect him, and there's some code in there it's possible she poisoned this guy to get rid of him. She had a loving relationship with, with uh, Joseph, and you'll see that in, in, in what you're going to see in a few minutes. And she, I think, bumped this guy off, bumped the pharaoh off. So she didn't want the other woman's son, Tutmosis III, to have good claim to the throne. So what she did, she took the Pharaoh's real true daughter, and she may have only two or three years old, and Tutmosis III as a little boy was maybe three or four years old. She married the daughter she had with Joseph to Tutmosis III, took the Pharaoh's daughter and gave it to Joseph. That's the story about Potiphar gives the daughter of blah, blah. That's what she did. Nobody ever figured that out. But Moses is telling you that in plain. The only way this could be that God has made me father to Pharaoh, he was, he was his father-in-law because he married his daughter. This is a family tree that one of the universities created. 
Um, the red is a, um, the woman in, in line. The black is the pharaoh. And these are non-royal blood. So it shuts up Tutmosis. They have here Nefura, which is true. They were thinking, there's a question mark here in dots here, that may be married to Tutmosis III, but no, wasn't. Married to Joseph. Tutmosis III had Joseph's daughter, that's why it's his son-in-law. They gave birth to Aminahotep II. You see this guy? You're going to learn in part two. This is Joseph's grandson. He's the one who enslaved 11 of the 12 tribes, his grandson. His Tutmosis III is an adult, good-looking guy. Uh, uh, Mitri, hard to find anything, any statues of her. I don't think they wanted to have one because they knew who she really was, who the real father really was. So we have this and a Stella monument stone with a description of this marriage. This looks like a woman. It was labeled as her. I don't know. But it's possible. Good looking. Okay, I'm going to go into proof that they had a, Joseph and Hachetzab had a loving relationship. Her monument tomb is below here. There's caves that the workmen built did above it. And in one of these caves, they found this. Here's a pharaoh bent over, and guess who this is? Um, a little loving relationship, wouldn't you think? Everybody must have known it. All the workmen must have known it. That's why they did this. Here's more pictures of, these are labeled as Senmut, but now you know Senmut is Joseph. So remember the, the word ministering? teaching the daughter, and probably her also. Uh, here's another one. Here's another one. He had a lot of these monuments made. When you're filthy rich, you can afford it. Here, another one. This is a smaller one. It's not a big one like these. It's a smaller one. Now, he was, he was also the head of one of the re religious cults of um, Hathor, which is the uh, fertility god in Egypt. And it has the face of a cow, but sometimes it's a female face with cow ears and this kind of appearance. Uh, here's one statue of Sanmut with the cow god chisel in the front. This one, they tore his face off finally. And there's a cow god, but it tells you he, he was the authority in this. He controlled that, that religion. In the beginning, he also controlled Amun also. And here's a better one, undamaged, of him and Hathor. You know, that little, that little uh, um, uh, golden calf that his father gave him? Kind <laughs> of like that. It's gone to that. This is how close they were, if you have any doubts. Here's her monument thing that he designed. There's his tomb. There's a closer look at the tomb. And in the tomb, oh, we go to how do you, the correct spelling of Sanmut. I've seen Sanmut with two N's. It's wrong. This is actually a game called Sanmut. There's the S. There's the S. The A, and sometimes I've spelled it San with an A rather than an E, is an eagle. There's your eagle. One N. The N is there. Squiggly line. Only one N. This is a farm implement. This is a, it pronounces a U. It's not on this one. In the book, it has a whole bunch of additional characters. And then finally, the, the T is this right here, Sanmut. <coughs> Why did Joseph choose Sanmut for his Egyptian name? There's an island in the middle of the Nile called Sanmut, now called Bija, in northern Nubia. In antiquity, it was the site of uh, Abaton, the unapproachable, the place where Osiris was buried and thereby where the two great mystical caverns from which the Nile traditionally poured forth. And there's the reference for it. In other words, he saw in Egyptian mythology 
they had a cave where the Nile came out and the gods were, well, his family had a cave also where they thought they were talking to God or the operating system for sure. So that's the reason why he adopted Sanmut. Here's the other proof that Moses gives us. See, there's two sides of the story. The Hebrew spelling of Sanmut is this. In, in Hebrew small numbering, it's equal to 30. The Torah says the Hebrews were slaves for 430 years, as the reference. In Genesis, though, it says for 400 years. Well, why the difference? The 400 comes from the 400 shekels Abraham bought the cave for. And the 30 is what Joseph put into the cave is the reason why they were slaves for, uh, un, I know how many number of years it is. It was 130 years, and I'll show it to you and prove it to you later. The 30 is the total the, in small number of Sanmut when Joseph was prime minister and what he shoved in the family burial cave. And that's why they were slaves. Now, <clears throat> this is important. Uh, you have a table here. It's reprinted in, in the book. On this side is what the scholars say Sanmut's authority was and what his titles were. This guy had a colossal ego. I saw one list that was like about 40 or 38. I have 35 of them listed here. And I go through them, and you'll see what I mean. This is irrefutable proof. Joseph is Sanmut. Sanmut is Joseph. I'd have to go any further than the first one. Where of the royal seal. Pharaoh gave Joseph her signet ring of office. There's a reference. Genesis 41, 42. Moses tells you. Gave her the, his, her the ring of authority. She was playing with Pharaoh then. And he ran the show. Chief of the king, prime minister of Egypt, second to the Pharaoh. There's a reference. Chief of the mansion of the Red Crown, that's, that's their, their household. Overseer of the household of Potiphar, there it is, there's a reference. Chief steward of Amun, his wife was the daughter of the priest of An. Well, she was the head of Amun, chief steward. That was his job as Sanmut, there's the proof of it. Companion greatly beloved. I, I highlighted these in pink because we're talking love, affection, and um, a meaningful relationship, we'll call it. Potiphar's wife wanted to have an affair with Joseph. I use that as a reference. There's no question. The way Moses makes it sound like Joseph, oh, wouldn't go near, would never do anything like that. Don't believe a word of it. Went right to her, hey, got her pregnant, had one baby with her, maybe even a second one. Uh, conductor of festivals, prime minister. Father tutor of the queen's daughter, Again, ministered, you saw it, him holding the daughter, which eventually became his wife. Heraldry, prince, court, I didn't find a match for that one. Keeper of the heart of the pharaoh, scan, girlfriend. Keeper of the palace, overseer of the Hebrew, household of Potiphar. Uh, uh, Magid of the tens of upper and lower Egypt, overseer of all the lands of Egypt. He needed that because he had to grow a lot of wheat or corn, or whatever they were growing, foodstuffs. Making all things come to pass for the spirit of her majesty, prime minister of Egypt, and lover too. <clears throat> Making content the lady of both lands, that would be the pharaoh, part of his wife again, uh, may have been a commander of the army, and counted if he was the prime minister, he definitely was. Uh, legendary Jews say he fought the descendants of Esau when they tried to when they ran out of money, they tried to invade Egypt to steal the, the foodstuffs at Sukkot. And he raised the Egyptian army, and he defeated them and slaughtered them. Overseer of private chambers, that's our friend Joseph, the butler. Overseer of the Shehor's house, his wife was the daughter of the priest of An, or Amun. Overseer of the administrative offices of the mansion, Again, Potiphar put him in, in, of Joseph in charge of his household. Overseer of the building of the god Amun in charge of the temple lands, there. Overseer of the cattle of Amun, again. I guess he raised beef too. Overseer of the double gold house in charge of the treasury. He collected the money. 
It says in the story that Pharaoh says, once they wanted food, go to Joseph to buy the food. Um, overseer of the double gold house in charge of the treasury, um, in charge of the double granary, in charge of the food storage. Overseer of the fields, again, overseer of the lands of Potiphar. He, he basically had to control all the land they can get his hands on that the state owned or the religious organizations owned to raise a lot of wheat. Overseer of the gardens of Amon, again, same thing. Uh, he needed all the land to raise stuff. Overseer of the, go the gods, storehouses, orchard, and other property. Had a habit in order to wind up accomplishing this. Overseer of the queen's bathroom. <laughs> I don't even have to say why. <laughs> Overseer of the queen's bedroom. He's sleeping with her, no question about it. Overseer of the royal lands. Overseer of Potiphar's, which is Pharaoh's lands. Overseer of the royal palace, same thing. Overseer of the works, construction, engineering, architect. He had to have this power in order to build all the things and the, the warehouses. I'm going to show you in, in the second video uh, what's left of Sukkot and the warehouses and what they looked like and where it was located. Privy Council, private discreet council of Pharaoh, prophet of both Matu and Amun. Um, again, this prophecy. Steward of her estate, overseer of the household of Potiphar, steward of the king's daughter, Nefura, overseer of the household, blah, blah, Potiphar, but also a barrier. <laughs> the queen's steward, he was the butler in the prison story. Administrator of the Egyptian calendar, his knowledge he got from inside the cave. So at this point, there's no question, it's him. This is uh, her funeral tomb. On the left-hand side is, this is Hathor, the god Hathor. The, and his name is in one of these pillars here. It's in this area, this temple area. In his tomb, there was a, a, um, a sky, a, a star chart in the ceiling. It's kind of weird. Now, I place this event where he becomes prime minister, and this dream happens, in 1488 BCE. Um, I think he died around the year 60, when he was 66 years old, not what they say. In this here, in Jacob, they, in the storyline, I suppose they, he lives to 147, no. But we know that Joseph was 17 years old when he was sold into slavery. 17 from 147 gives you 130. I think that, and it worked out, 130 years is when 11 of the 12 tribes were slaves in Egypt to the other pharaoh. And the reason I say that besides that is also after the exodus and they're in the wilderness uh, and they're at Mount Sinai, they are told each one of the tribes have to produce a silver bowl of 130 shekels of silver. Now why is the weight so important unless it's something that they're all going to be, they're all commemorating, which has got to be the period of slavery. So this is how I figured it out, and it worked out perfectly. From here on in, I can figure out everybody's birth within 20 to 22 years. Uh, I can figure out the genealogy, and you're going to see it in part three of this series. Nefura, Joseph's wife. Joseph's Egyptian wife's name was really Nefuri. Uh, the most likely spelling is this, produced two numbers which showed up in, in the Torah. 17 in small numbering and 530 in large numbering. The 17 I just explained, that was the age where supposedly you became a slave. The 530 was tougher to find out, but it was this, Moses gave the genealogy of supposedly of the, the tribe of Levi, but he only gave it for four generations. And it was this, Levi, 137 years, Korath, 103 years, 133 years, uh, Amran, his father, 137 years, and Aaron, 123 years. That total, 530. So I'm sure this is the spelling of 
Nefur, Nefur, I think I'm pronouncing it right, right. There is no question that he did marry the queen's daughter and that meant his sons were in the royal line and had a claim to the throne. This also shows that Moses knew the whole relationship and what it meant. This is also why Moses was raised in the Pharaoh's household, or compound, I should say. Like, the Pharaoh would have a house and all of his relatives, immediate relatives, were in an area that had a wall around it and they all lived there. Joseph's children. This is a case of the encoding of all the names and what Moses is saying. This is why you have to know Moses' 10 code systems. Nephura had two sons with Joseph, the oldest was Manassas and the younger was Ephraim, or Ephraim. Even though Manassas was the older, Jacob, on his deathbed, blessed Ephraim. And this was the reason. The cave was purchased from Ephron, the Hittite son of Zohar. The name Ephra, Ephraim and Ephraim sound very similar, but Hebrew spelling of Ephron is this, is much different from the spelling of Ephraim. Ephraim is made up of two smaller words. The bet uh, before means in. The rest of it means dry earth or gold dust. Finally, the final nun is equal to 700 in large numbering because it's the last, it's the last letter in the word. Um, and that meant Mount Sinai. 700, seven is Mount Sinai. So it's gold in Mount Sinai or gold in the mountain. Couldn't get any plainer than that. He's basically screaming at us of so many of these names. <laughs> Either David, you know, Joseph put the stuff in the cave or there's gold in the mountain. You can take about Zohar apart and it means mountain of the law. That is Mount Sinai. The reason Jacob blessed Ephraim, uh, the younger, is because Jacob must have known what Joseph had done and put inside, inside the, feral, the family burial cave. By the way, the, the blessings, of quote unquote blessings that Jacob does on his deathbed, you read them, they're not blessings at all. Uh, they're more like he also did something inside that cave and saw the future of each one of his sons. The meaning of Joseph's name, this is funny. I decided to see what Joseph's name was. Okay, it, it spelled this. Uh, if you take the the three letters of his name and swap the Samic for its previous adjacent letter, you get none, which means, means this, which means dung, mung, or mire. The final pay is equal to eight in, in small numbering and represents the, tre the, the treasure is where the treasure is located. I'll get my, my mouth to work eventually. My conclusion is that Moses thought Joseph was the dung of the earth. It was shit of the earth. A real piece of crap, because of what he did and what he, what he put inside the family burial cave, thereby dishonoring the whole family. I agree with Moses, but he really dishonored one particular family, which you'll find out in part three. When did Moses become prime minister? Remember in video series seven, God's Code Systems, part one and two. You should see it again. <clears throat> 1488, 12,068 days cycles back from that drop dead date. I'm not kidding. When Tutmosis dies, 105.5, Aaron's born, 104 cycles back. The Exodus, 101.5 cycles back. My question is, is uh, how much free will do we really have if this stuff's being programmed? <laughs> this is funny. If you're in New York City, you're going to have a lot of fun with this. Um, Sandmud sarcophagus was found in pieces uh, in, the, in the area just below Chetsup's tomb. And they, it was a thousand pieces, and they put it together. This is Joseph's uh, sarcophagus. They never found his body because his body was laid to rest in Shechem, north of Jerusalem. That's why, that's why Joseph was not buried with the rest of the family in the family burial cave because he dishonored it so much. 
but what he did. So they carried him to the new, to the promised land where they buried him in Shechem. It's now in the, uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Enjoy it. That's Joseph's tomb or sarcophagus. Joseph, okay, part two is going to be this. Uh, you're going to find out how he became the richest man in the world at the time, why he bought, he bought his family into Egypt uh, and where they were living, why 11 of the 12 tribes went into slavery, which pharaoh enslaved the 11 tribes and why, where the gold and silver went and he, uh, that he collected in the sale of the, uh, of the food. You'll know where Belzephon is. You'll see the path he took and how he did this whole thing. Hope you enjoyed. I think you learned something. But, but this is amazing, what you're seeing here. <clears throat> Die Hole Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit foundation. And uh, contributions are used for geological research, but some of this also. I um, hope you enjoyed the, the video. And uh, remember one thing. This is what you're seeing here is all an act of the operating system slash God. It's not by accident. I'll go into this later.